The Oklahoma City Thunder fall in overtime to the New Orleans Pelicans. SGA sets a career high. Josh Giddy racks up another double-double, but could he have found a new wrinkle of a role offensively for the Oklahoma City Thunder? And Jalen Williams continues to check boxes. We'll talk about that on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your teams every day. I am your host. Media member and editor in chief over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, the Thunder lose in overtime to the Pelicans as SGA sets a new career high in a wacky back and forth game. Jalen Williams checks another box into his progression. Kenny Hustle, steady as they come. Josh Giddy gets another double double. But more importantly, there might have been a new wrinkle of a role offensively for him flashed by the Thunder in this game against New Orleans. We'll talk about all that coming up, but we start the way we always do with our game overview. For the Thunder, Jaden Williams out of Arkansas, out with a concussion. Usman Jang was out with that wrist injury, which is uh, about five more weeks for reevaluation for him, or, or four maybe now, but it's, it's at least four or five. Uh, Jeremiah robinson Earl, who's still week to week, is out with an ankle injury, and then Chet Holmgren out with that season-ending foot injury. And then the only player that did not play coach's decision was Eugene Omarui. For the Pelicans, they did not have Zion, Brandon Ingram, or Larry Nance Jr., but still were able to have a lot of success in this game. The Thunder start out with SGA, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, Jathan Williams, and Poku. Those five played the most minutes for OKC, who actually got out to a hot start. Typically in this season... The story of the season has been the Thunder start slow in the first quarter, and then they're able to turn it up, uh, you know, in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, make an epic comeback. In the first quarter, the Thunder led by like, what, eight, nine points uh, to get things going. And then from the middle of that first quarter, throughout the rest of the first half, New Orleans just owned the market. It was extremely frustrating, so much so that in the second quarter, two possessions in, Mark called the timeout for the Thunder, in the first half, at the about halfway point in the first quarter and on, the Thunder just could not buy a bucket. They could not buy a bucket. They were missing bunny jumpers. They were missing open threes. They just could not find a way to score. Really, to put into perspective just how cold everyone was offensively for OKC, even SGA went 0 for 2 on a free throw, like on a free throw trip, which is unheard of this season for SGA. That all led to the Pelicans growing a 21-point lead, which was trimmed down to 18 by halftime. So an 18-point lead for the Pelicans in a game that still saw another lead, three more lead changes uh, to go. Six times this game was tied. OKC eventually found their way into an eight-point lead after they were incredible in the third and fourth quarter. The game really got some momentum whenever Poku hit a three and Dort drew an illegal screen back-to-back possessions. But... In that fourth quarter, the Thunder faded a bit and turned to ice again. And in in the overtime period, it was all Pelicans. Now, there's just a lot to decompress from this game in general. Uh, But the bottom line remains that when you lose in overtime and you have to come back from down 21 points each night, eventually you're going to run out of gas. Look, basketball is a game of runs, and you used your entire run in the third and fourth quarter just to break even, just to pull ahead by eight points. Well, then it's their turn to make a run, and their run only needs to be nine points, right? Whereas your run had to be 21. So that's the danger of getting down by these deficits. You lose your momentum. You lose your steam over the course of time whenever you have to fall from behind and fight from behind so much. And in this matchup, you know, Trey Mann takes the final shot of regulation and the final possession of OT was just a discombobulated possession 
where they needed a three, but it was an Isaiah Joe spinning low block, you know, jump shot, and then he missed it, and Giddy got it back, then tried a reverse layup, which did not fall either. It was not a good possession at the at the end of overtime, nor at the end of regulation. Now at the end of regulation. Mark explained that the play was drawn up for Shea, but the Pelicans denied him very well, and that Trey Mann just had to be in the spot where Shea was supposed to be and just had to kind of go from there. Now, he was matched up on CJ McCollum, which is the matchup that you want to attack if you're OKC, and Mann did a good job of breaking down his guy and getting to the rack, uh, but once he got there, the Pelicans played beautiful help side defense, rotated over, and took away the shot, uh, which would have been a cool storybook for Mann to end his his up-and-down fantastic week um, on a game winner, but you've got to try to get the ball to Shea there. The Thunder did try, but the Pelicans did a good job of denying who they wanted to get the ball to. And that's kind of, that's kind of what this team is lacking right now. And what they get back whenever they get Chet, what they get back whenever they draft a, a good 2023 draft pick, what they get back whenever Josh Giddy continues to progress. When everyone knows that you're going to go to Shea, someone else has to step up. And right now the team is too young to step up. Right now the team is just not flushed out enough to step up uh, to help Shea and help alleviate some of that pressure off of Shea. And the teams are always going to try to deny Shea. He's a 30-point-per-game score. you got to find ways to get him the ball whenever teams deny him. But that comes with having your other players respected. And right now the Thunder, you know, you know, kind of complimentary players have not earned that respect quite yet, but they're still young enough to do that um, eventually. And, and another big thing was, the Thunder just could not hit their open threes. Like the timely three, we, we can look at this, you know, in terms of shot percentage. You know, percentage wise, the Thunder shot thirty-seven percent from three, and the Pelicans shot thirty-five percent from three. So percentage wise, the Thunder actually shot better from the three-point line than than New Orleans did. But timeliness of the shots, all in favor of New Orleans. And when the Thunder desperately needed to step in wide open three, all of them were offline. The Thunder had three wide open threes at the crunch time of this game in the fourth and third quarter, uh, fourth and overtime period could not knock them down, which again, it's just the timeliness of when you were hitting those shots, when you need those shots. But the good part of this game, it is another clutch time game for OKC, which the Thunder lead the NBA in clutch time games, clutch time minutes. And it is good experience. As SGA said after the game, you have to learn from this kind of game, regardless of the results. And you have to give the Thunder credit on the complimentary players who we just talked about how at the, at the end of games, it can hurt you whenever, okay, it's the last possession, got to get the ball in, and the other team is just going to be lengthy enough to deny Shea. What do you do then? But where it helped you in this game was, and where they deserve a lot of credit is, SGA did a great job in the third quarter getting the Thunder within three. Got the Thunder within three. They even they kind of went back and forth with the lead in the third quarter, but got the Thunder within three. And so whenever he leaves, the Thunder are down three. And so he plays, you know, he, he sits on the bench the entire fourth quarter until the seven minute mark, which is usual for him. But by the time that SGA returned to the floor, that Thunder complimentary group to Shea had grown an eight point lead. And so you're feeling really good. You're feeling like, hey, we've battled back from 21, now own an eight point lead. And now our best player is returning to the floor. And the best player on the floor is returning to the floor. And they end up falling despite leading 112 to 106 at the 125 mark. And a lot of that is due to the timely missed threes and then missing seven free throws in regulation. Going back to the shooting percentages, typically the Thunder shoot better at the free throw line than their, than their opponent. Tonight, it was the Pelicans who shot 82% from three and the Thunder who shot 72%. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Pelicans who shot 82% from the free throw line and the Thunder who shot 72% from the free throw line. And so that's how you get in this spot where you lose 128 to 125 in overtime. The Pelicans dominated the glass 55-47. The Thunder, one points in the paint, though, 66-55. Uh, and then the Thunder also dominate fast uh, break points by 11. The Pelicans did win second chance effort, though, and the Pelicans also had 21 turnovers. OKC had just 18 turnovers, and the Thunder won points off turnovers, 22-17. to So all in all, this was a good game for the Thunder to gain experience, to, to understand what it's like to close games and try to play in these competitive environments. But their biggest flaw so far is getting down. Like I said, you only have so many runs in a given game and the, and basketball is about runs. They let the Pelicans have a run of getting up 21. All they can do is fight back even and then, and then grow an eight point lead. But it's a lot different of exertion to coast for half of the game. Like the Pelicans had to do then ramp back up to get an eight point lead back, you know, to score nine straight points. Like there's a lot different 
than, than expending all of your energy in the third and fourth quarter to climb and claw back from down 21, down 18. You know, it, it's just, it's totally different in the, in the sense of how long you can capture the momentum. It's like playing capture the flag. Like it's, you can only hold it for so long. You, you can only hold that ground for so long um, in terms of holding the momentum in basketball and, you know, running in the, in the different runs that you trade off back and forth throughout a game. So they've got to learn how to, how to not get down by 15 and 20 points before they start to click. And then also, you know, they've got to learn how to manage late game situations, especially knowing and understanding what to do whenever Shea is denied the ball. Cause that's going to happen more and more, especially this season, whenever there's not a ton of pressure relievers from SGA. So we'll talk about SGA and his career high night. Plus, uh, Talking about Josh Giddy double double and, and kind of a new role that you kind of saw him in a little bit offensively in this one, and how Jalen Williams checked yet another box for the Thunder. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is incredible. And my favorite part of Bet Online is you can go there right now and they have the best lines, odds, you know, prop bets, anything that you want to for all the different sports out there college and pro football, baseball, basketball, hockey darts, martial arts, soccer, tennis. They have everything that you want. And it's not just betting on the individual game. While you can do that, you can bet on tonight's game, uh, Rockets against the Bulls. Rockets are eight-point underdogs on the road in Chicago. But you can also bet on NBA specials, which can look like who is Trey Young's next team if he's traded from the Hawks. And right now the Mavericks are the favorite to land Trey Young, which would be Absolutely wild. Same question for DeMar DeRozan, who it's favored to be the Lakers if he's traded from the uh, from the Bulls. And anything else that you want to get your hands on in terms of even NBA draft steps out there right now. So first round draft pick, who will be the first overall pick? Will it be Victor or Scoot? Right now, Scoot's at plus 1,600. So you can go check that out if you think that Scoot Henderson is going to be you know, kind of a, a guy to keep an eye on. You can bet on who you think will win the NBA championship and the NCAA championship all at bet online plus just the normal spreads and over unders and money line of each individual game from both cope uh, pro and college also with all the other sports that we mentioned so check it out today bet online is where the game starts we are back on the lockdown thunder podcast on the lockdown podcast network your teams every day thank you so much for making lockdown thunder your first listen every single morning every single day we're here for you talking thunder basketball for your second listen Go check out the Lockdown Sports Today podcast. The Lockdown Sports Today podcast is there for you uh, to get you caught up on everything you need in the world of sports on YouTube and any other podcasting app that you can find. So are we. Go subscribe to Lockdown Thunder on YouTube as well uh, and drop a comment down below how you feel about this game. Let's talk SGA. Set a career high 44 points after scoring 42.3 straight times. So it was good for him to set a new career high after kind of matching his old career high a couple of times. He shot 58% from the floor to get to 44 points. That is incredible. Three for four from three, including a step back three, which are electric. Whenever SJ has that three-point shot working, especially that three-point uh, step back, it's so fun to watch. It is so enjoyable as a, a, as a basketball consumer to see him go to work like that, three for four from three, 58% shooting and 44 points with 10 rebounds, six assists, two steals, a block. He was dropping dimes and, and lost in the hustle and bustle of, um, you know, the lost in the hustle and bustle of the like improved scoring and getting up to 31 points per game and and being this MVP caliber player is just the quality of passes that he's able to make this year. It's just on another level for him. He had 18 first half points, just incredible in this game. And let's not forget, it wasn't as though the Pelicans were just giving him a lane to the basket or the Pelicans were just getting out of his way. Dyson Daniels and Herb Jones really made life tough on SGA, really made SGA work. But SGA is able to hit these unnatural, just unguardable, extremely tough buckets. It is unreal shot making over defenders that SGA is able to capitalize on with his length, with his frame, with his shot point release, with his ability to get to the rim and slither his way there. Like it is amazing to see. He's also dunking the ball more, which every Shea dunk just gets me excited. He's already closing in on his uh, career high in dunks, which is only 23 in a season, but he's already almost there at, at, at Christmas time, which is great for him. I think that SGA's leap has been seen at every level 
except for the three-point line. And in this game, he goes three for four um, at the three-point line. It is special to have another one of these players. And SGA has 19 dunks already. So he needs, what, four more to match his career high and then five more to to top it. Seems like he's going to get there this season, knock on wood. But the ability of SGA and the skill level of SGA should not be normalized, especially not yet, especially for this organization. You're not promised these stars. And I know it feels that way because if you just started watching basketball in 2008, if you, if you've only followed this team before and never any other NBA team, it feels like, well, this is just routine. You know, you, you, you develop these stars and they become great and then everyone pans out and it's all hunky dory. It's not the case. You're not guaranteed 30 point per game score. I know you had Kevin Durant, I know you had Russ Westbrook, I know you had Paul George, and you know James Harden eventually became that as well in his next stop, and and now Shea has become that as well. But you don't always get thirty point per game scores in your in your franchise. Treasuring what SGA brings is just as important as you know SGA himself bringing it. Go support SGA, vote for him into the All Star game, go support this team as a whole. And SGA is playing really well with Josh Giddy. And there was a moment in this game where SGA grabbed the wrist of Josh Giddy and walked him away from the ref to avoid Giddy getting a technical foul, which just showed leadership and their connection together as well. Uh, but Giddy continues to play very well. Um, he had three fouls before the six-minute mark, which is why he was animated with the, ref- with the referees. So OKC ended up having to play his rotation different down the stretch. He was up to five fouls already, so they couldn't really close with him in regulation, but then over time, you might as well just throw him out there for the last five minutes. There's no point in, in holding on to it, you know, because if he gets the sixth foul, it doesn't really matter at that point. It's overtime. Uh, so he played 34 minutes still, though. 10 points, I, mean, I should say 10 rebounds, 20 points, six assists, a steal, a block, and in the last 10 games, he's averaging a double-double. He shot 60% from the floor and two for three from three, and after the game, he said that the biggest help of Chip England so far is convincing Josh Giddy, hey, you don't have to prove to us you can shoot. You don't have to prove to the negative commenters. You don't have to prove to anyone that you can shoot. And that has helped Josh improve his shot selection, which Josh pointed out. Like Josh said that like last year, he was bound and determined to prove he can shoot, so he was just jacking them. And that's what hurt his percentages. This year, he's taking more shots that he's comfortable with, and it's seen his percentages rise. In the last 10 games, again, he's averaging a 20-point double-double. And before the game, I asked Mark about uh, that stretch because it was it was nine games at that point of averaging a 20-point double-double. And Mark said that you know he's really made the adjustment to the adjustment and the game was slowing back down for him um, over this last stretch. And that is an incredible pace for him to be able to diagnose the issue, fix the issue to this degree. And the new role I want to point out for Josh Giddy. ever since Al Horford played for Oklahoma City, I've been – preaching about how Mark really likes to utilize the high post playmaker. And so when we're breaking down Jalen Williams out of Arkansas and we're breaking down Jeremiah Robinson Earl, we're breaking down these bigs. I've been pointing out, Hey, I know it's not a sexy skill, but Mark really likes to utilize the high post playmaking. Well, maybe, maybe that, that isn't about a big because in this game specifically, you saw many instances, and over this last week where he's played these two games against Portland and against um, New Orleans, you've seen the Thunder use him in the high post with, as a post-up player, and it's helped him get to those backdoor cuts, passes, where, he, where he's passing the ball on a bounce to, to Jalen Williams cutting back door, or he's finding different angles to get these passes off in the high post as a post-up player. So maybe Josh Giddy is that post-up playmaker. Maybe Josh Giddy is going to be the guy that facilitates you know, in an area that Mark likes to utilize because it does help him. And he has the size to do it. He's a six, eight point card. He claims he's six, nine. If you read his Twitter bio, he still has not changed his Twitter bio. His Twitter bio still says six, nine point card. So he claims he's six, nine. So he's got the size to be able to be a post up playmaker. And if you, if you've watched these last two games and keenly look at him, a lot of his sister coming as a post up guy at the elbow, a little higher up than the elbow in the high post. Like, Maybe that is just going to be the niche for Josh Giddy and, and be an area of exploitation that the Thunder can find. So I'll be, I'll be looking for that throughout the rest of the season of how much they go back to that well, that they went to this season a lot, but especially this, this last week they went to a lot 
with Josh Giddy. So maybe whenever I tell you that Mark likes the high post playmakers and I've been pointing out Jay will and I've been pointing out, you know, maybe Kenny can do it. Maybe JRE can do it. Maybe it's all about Josh Giddy, and that's the role that he can thrive in in the half court offense. But coming up, we will tell you about how Jalen Williams from Santa Clara checked yet another box in this game against the Pelicans. Poku pops in the 31 minutes he played and Kenny hustle is as steady as they come. But first I want to say right now, but our good friends over at the NHTSA. Folks, let's say that you're hanging out with some friends, you're putting a few back, and a few becomes a few too many. So as the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling yourself a ride, but nah, you live nearby, you'll make it home okay, it's no big deal. What are the odds that you'll get pulled over anyway? And even if you do, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you kill someone. Everyone knows the risk of driving drunk. The results, the results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still does not stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Plan and play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I want to talk right now about Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara. Look, he checked another box. And... and if you hear me say that and you pause this podcast right now and you go look at the box score from Friday night, you're going to think I'm crazy. You are. The box score doesn't scream at you. But watching it, what screams at you is Jalen Williams had the worst first half of his career. He shot one of eight in the first half, usually an extremely efficient shooter. Shot one of eight in the first half, played 13 minutes, two turnovers. So he's shooting one of eight. He's got two turnovers and a foul. He did get four rebounds. The four rebounds were good, but one of eight, two turnovers and a foul. Worst first half of his career. And he could have let that bother him. He could have let that derail his second half. He could have let that get out of his element. He could have just shrugged his shoulders and said, you know what? It's an off game. Everyone has them. It's an off game. I'm looking forward to these three days off coming up. We've been playing every other night. Looking forward to the three days off coming up. Forget it. It's a rough game. We move on. We'll play again Tuesday. But instead, he was able to shake it off snap and clear, and get ready for the second half. And in that second half, he shot two of three for six points, two rebounds, two assists, a massive putback jam, the driving slams that are just energy-giving plays. When the team was cold in the first half, when the team looks lackadaisical, when the team is lacking so much they get down 21 points, these energy-giving plays from J-Dub really helps, especially that second unit, continue to thrive, continue to go. And eventually that second unit got an eight-point lead without Shea on the floor. For Shea to return to. He has tough bucket making ability. He finishes the game with 11 points, three assists, seven rebounds, and makes a positive impact in this one, despite playing the worst first half of his career. And so that, that ability to play terrible, then snap out of it, is not something that every player has, especially at a very young age. J Dub seems to have it. And we'll see. That's his, that was his first ever test of adversity in an NBA game. He got knocked in the eye before, which allowed him to not play in the game anymore. So like that was adversity, but it wasn't, it wasn't you're tested with adversity in this very same game, which he was on Friday and overcame it very well. Pokashevsky also played well. Like all things considered, the only thing that, that, that bothered Poku was the foul trouble. And just based on sure size and against Jackson Hayes and against uh, some of the guys that the Pelicans can throw at you, he's going to get in foul trouble. I call those frame fouls, like his frame and the and the and being lengthy and then just coming over the top of somebody. Those are going to happen. He's going to rack up three fouls a night, and then when you throw in some size and get a couple size fouls, you're up to five already. So the, the foul trouble is not very good. But he did shoot 63% from the floor. He shot three of five from three, 60% from deep after shooting poorly in December, very poorly in December. Broke out of it Friday. Shot three of five from three. Also had a block, had four steals on the defensive end. Was in the right spot at the right time. Three assists, six rebounds, and 17 points. Very good from him in the 31 minutes. 
Also, a hat tip to Trey Mann. I know that that final play regulation is going to taint some things for some fans, but Trey Mann played three games in three nights with a flight from Vegas to OKC thrown in the mix. He dominated the G League, just absolutely dominated it. He had a three to tie the game, which I was happy for him. Like the three to tie the game, I was extremely happy that he got that moment um, to hear the crowd pop and, and, and to feel like he was really helping the NBA team. Uh, scored nine points, had a block, went three for five from uh, the three-point line. He did go 0 of 3 from inside the arc, but 3 of 5 from the three-point line was good for him, especially as, as, again, he has not shot the ball very well. And, and Trey Mann's not shot the ball very well all season long. It's just been the December stretch for Poku. But Mann has not shot, shot the ball all season long very well. And then Kenny Hustle deserves a lot of credit for being as steady as they come. A lot of these guys in the um, Thunder organization, they're young. You don't know what to expect from them. Um, they're inconsistent because they're so young. With Kenny Hustle, he's, he's really steady. Nine points a night, five rebounds, two assists in this game, three for six from the floor, one for three from three, which that one three put OKC up 87 to 83. Now played good defense as well. You just know that you're going to get a quality night from him every night that he steps on the floor, which is something that you can really depend on. And then I want to put into perspective just how, uh, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what the word to use, you know, how long they have to go or what they need to do in the off season, whatever it is. But they shot 37% from three. And again, they couldn't make the timely three-point shots, but they shot 37% from three. And when Isaiah Joe is a cold shooting night, it really hurts this team. Like, they win this game if Isaiah Joe goes two for three from three or, or three for three from three, you know, shoots better than 0 for three. They win this game. But that's a lot of pressure to put on Isaiah Joe. When he's the guy that you can turn to to get you a three-pointer, and he's the guy as in the only guy that you can go to, to for sure get you a three-pointer, and he goes 0 for 3, your offense stalls that way. And so this is not a criticism of Isaiah Joe. This is this was not a bad game. He didn't take a single bad shot uh, besides the spinning low block thing, but he was kind of in a pressurized situation there. But it just shows that the Thunder need to continue to add three-point shooting. That way it can help everyone else out. Because we know that Isaiah Joe is going to pop off a couple threes on Tuesday, and he'll be right back in the groove, and he's one of the better three-point shooters in the NBA right now, statistically speaking. Um, so, you know, he's going to be fine. But again, it just shows the pressure that's put on him due to the roster construction of this team to always be on from three. And what do we put on him in the mind of the roster construction? Because that's his main NBA skill set. That's really his only true NBA skill set. He has a few other things that he does well, but that's what keeps him as a rotational NBA player. And that's a lot of pressure on an individual. But the day was OKC minus two and a half. Pelicans, of course, covered. They won the game outright. MVP of the game has to be SGA. Now, here's what's to come. Tuesday's show, we're going to do what we learned to this point in the season so far for Oklahoma City. Around Christmas, the halfway point, around kind of the, the time that we start to kind of try to figure out these teams, what have we learned about OKC so far this year? Wednesday, we're going to recap that Spurs game. Thursday, we're going to do our New Year's resolutions for the Thunder. Friday, we're going to do our Hornets recap. So stay tuned, subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms so you never miss an episode. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.